Tony Rusamato worked out in the San Jose Bureau of ABC 7. The Matthew Shepard story was one he didn't cover. Those who saw the documentary of the Times and Harvey Mulk will remember a radio announcer's comment just after the verdict was announced. That voice was Tony Rusamato, a reporter of the KSFO video at the time and one of the four original filmmakers. The death of Matthew Shepard was a turning point in gay homophobia. Um, homophobia had been building through the uh, 1990s and it reached a climax with Shepard's death. The death was so hideous, heinous, so terrible, terrifying to see this, to, to hear of this person beaten, put up on the fence, left to die, this cute little kid, that even the most obnoxious, right-wing, brain-dead, Republican, god-awful bigots had to stop and think, maybe this wasn't such a good thing. And it reached its denouement in early 1999, oddly enough, when Jerry Falwell declared that Tinky Winky was gay. And that story, as laughable as it was, really is an, is an indication of how the, how the culture changed, that people began seeing gays differently and homophobia as a real problem. Unfortunately, it had no lasting effect. I checked the FBI crime statistics before I came up here, and uh, uh, violence against gays, reported crimes, uh, hate crimes uh, against gays, essentially have been stable since 1998. It's averaging about 15, 17 percent of all hate crimes. The total number really is, has uh, not changed either. So while it attracted a great deal of attention in the culture, it really had no lasting effect. Also, it was, it was kind of generational. Uh, there were people, I think my age and maybe older, who lived through Stonewall, who lived through the AIDS crisis, who are living through the AIDS crisis, and lost, I lost all of my friends. I, you know, everyone I know is a ghost. Vast legions of ghosts in San Francisco. Everybody I, I grew up with, every gay person I knew in high school, every gay person I knew in college, most gay people I knew after college, they're dead. I survived, and there are a few people like me who survived, and, and we wonder, you know, what, why is it? How did we make it through this? And when a story like Matthew Shepard comes along, we see the death, objectively, of one person, and think, gee, that's, that's, that's a shame, but you know, I've got 100,000 people here that I'm worried about right now. Um, so it affected, it affected younger people, I think, uh, a lot more than, uh, than people who were in San Francisco, especially, and lived through the, I, I was also in Jonestown, covering uh, Diana and People's Temple, and stepped off the plane from, uh, from Guyana and stepped into the Harvey Milk killings. And, uh, people who lived through that, I think, had a, had a larger tolerance. I mean, a, uh, a hologram could appear in the air over San Francisco at this point, and you know, we'd look up and go, oh, yeah, San Francisco. <laughs> uh, so that is, I, I did not cover the Matthew Shepard uh, case. I, I, I was a reporter at the time with the KPIX, um, and my beat was with Silicon Valley, high tech, uh, the environment. My beat was not gay issues. I did do one gay story about that time. Sad to say, it was the Jerry Falwell Tinky Winky is gay story. Even sadder, it won an Emmy. <laughs> <laughs> Tommy Abicola Mackey is in many ways the activist for our generation. The death of Matthew Shepard would be the subject of a march from the Castro Hill Hall of Justice on Halloween night in 1990. I think the thing that struck me immediately when I heard about Matthew Shepard was um, that um, I was, knew I was going to be facing a lot of nightmares. Um, in, 19, um, in the mid-80s, mid I believe it was 1986, there was a particularly gruesome killing, I think it was probably even more gruesome than what happened to Matthew Shepard, in Philadelphia, right just outside Philadelphia. I was the editor of the Philadelphia Gay News at the time, and the victim was a, a young guy named Anthony Milano, who was an immigrant, Italian, um, who um, had come here to America like my ancestors had, because I come from an immigrant Italian family as well. And I immediately identified, immediately identified, and um, I took on the story even though I knew it was gonna be painful. But um, I guess uh, all of us journalists have a little masochism in us. And um, I went to the trial. Um, it was two weeks of agony for me. Anthony Milano wasn't just killed. The people who killed him slid his throat so many times that they actually exposed the bone. The, the coroner could not count, could not figure out how many times he'd been slashed. There was so much blood on the crime scene 
Um, and at the trial, I watched his parents, who were these, like, you know, four foot five immigrant Italians who looked like my family, sitting there, and they got so sick during the, when the coroner got out to, with diagrams and photos and all those things that coroners have to do with trials to talk about how Anthony died. He literally choked on his own blood, is how he, they concluded he died. Um, and I sat there and I, I, I still, it's still hard to talk about. I sat there and I looked at these parents. I just, that, that, I couldn't look at the diagrams, but I turned and I looked at his parents and the look on their faces I will never forget. They got up and they walked out of the courtroom. You know, and I was glad I got them walked up out of the courtroom also. And I went out and I talked to them. That trial, those two weeks, I will never forget. It. Whenever I hear of Gwen Arrow or anybody, you know, anybody who gets killed, I think of that. And I think of another case I covered, and uh, I'll mention really quickly, which was a whole series about a dozen black drag queens in Philadelphia. And this was also, I was also editor. And I also took that upon myself because these, the, the, the straight papers in Philly would not even cover, they didn't cover much of Anthony Milano as well, but they would not, definitely would not cover a bunch of black drag queens getting murdered. Um, and I went out to the bars where these young women hung out and I talked to people that they talked to. And I found out things that even the cops didn't know about what might have happened that night. And my story resulted in the straight media picking up the story and actually running with it and the police taking the case seriously because I think up until the point when I started nosing around, the police were just gonna write it off as, you know, just a bunch of seedy drag queens who got what they deserved. But I think it was, was our coverage of that story, just like our amazing coverage of Anthony Milano's case. I mean, not only did I cover Anthony Milano, I talked to his family. I went up and talked to neighbors. I talked to people who knew him because I was, I was determined that I was gonna make Anthony Milano come alive for people. And I was determined also that I was gonna make these black drag queens come alive for people. So when I hear of Matthew Shepard getting killed, I relive my years as the editor of the Philadelphia Gay News. Jeff Sheehy was working with Gilbert Baker organizing protests against organizations who refused to comply with the newly passed Equal Rights Ordinance in San Francisco. He remembers hearing of the beating of Matthew Shepard on his way to the Castro. And it actually was the Equal Benefits Ordinance. Um, speaking of Tiki Winky, one of the things Gilbert did was sew Tiki Winky costumes and we used them to take over a United ticket office just around the corner here. It's a memorable um, event. but. Um, I do remember hearing about it, and I'm sure Tommy and I were both in the Castro. We were working hand in hand at that point. There was a vigil at uh, Most Holy Redeemer, and then um, there was a question of, I think it was the first time the rainbow flag was lowered uh, to half mast. We had gotten it up in 97, the giant flag that's kind of become a symbol. Uh, Gilbert did work on that. Gilbert's our Bet Betsy Ross. He's the one who came up with the rainbow flag as a symbol for the movement. And uh, out, of, uh, out of that course of events, I think that the horror just kept getting worse and worse. And uh, we did decide to have a march uh, on the Hall of Justice. We did it on Halloween because we knew there'd be a lot of people in the Castro. We put an ad in the BAR, nice big page ad. I think Mike gave us a nice little discount for that. Um, the Queer Liberation Front was what we called ourselves, which freaked everybody out. We had cops following us all up and down because they'd never heard of this group before. <laughs> but we didn't want to associate it with any particular uh, group. And I think the point, at the time, I was also working in the DA's office. Um, Terrence Hallinan at the time was the DA, and he'd set up a position, a uh, victim advocate for same-sex victims of uh, domestic violence and also for victims of hate crime. And I think it's interesting what Tony said. We were seeing kind of a secular rise in hate crimes, in violence, and get, even in San Francisco. Now, my personal opinion that flew out of, that came out of DOMA, when we had a Democratic administration sign a law uh, crystallizing hatred and discrimination against lesbians and gays, and in, 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 in Congress, it kind of gave a green light. You know, Bubba gave a green light to everybody else to kind of have at it. Because I had a couple of, I, I saw a guy beaten up in, in the Castro, literally ch helped chase the kids to the to bar. They just, skate kids who just took a, uh, in the same time period, just took their skateboards and just started beating up on some guy at 18th and Castro. 